Hi, all. Uh, shall we begin? My name's Clinton Gormley. I work at Elasticsearch. Um, I've been involved with Elasticsearch for... Is that me or... Ah, back? Been uh, involved with Elasticsearch for four years now, since the first release, uh, and I'm currently writing uh, the definitive guide with O'Reilly and uh, my colleague Zach Tong, which is aimed to uh, be released in November. Um, but you can see it online uh, and read it online for free at elasticsearch.org slash guide. I'm guessing that most of you have heard of Elasticsearch, which is why you're here. How many people are using it in production? Okay, a fair, a fair number. So, um, this slide probably doesn't, uh, isn't really necessary for most of you, but I'll go through it for those who may not know. Elasticsearch is a real-time distributed search and analytics engine. So it does search, which is what Lucene does, but it handles full text and structured values like numbers, dates, geolocations, etc. as well. It can perform analytics on those values. It does this all in real time, and it's distributed, so it can scale out horizontally and support a huge amount of data. Um, the search part requires three chunks of functionality. The mapping, which is really how you define your fields. Is this an integer? Is it a date? Is it a geolocation? Is it a string? If it's a string, is it a, an exact value string, like a status code or something? Or is it a full text string? If it's a full text string, you want to analyze it before you index it to make it more searchable. Uh, and then once you've got these two uh, bits in place, you use the query DSL to actually query the data that's in there. The mapping and analysis parts are talks in their own right. They, they, are, they can be very complex, um, but we're going to start with some sort of very simple analysis, and we're going to focus on just the query DSL. The query DSL, it's how you query Elasticsearch. It's, uh, it's flexible, it's powerful, you can really express complex sets of logic and uh, relevance calculations, um, but it's a bit of a black box. People tend to copy and paste bits together, throw it in, into one big chunk of JSON and hope that it works. Not r many people understand how it works, and this is what the talk is about. There are actually two types of clauses in the query DSL. They're queries and they're filters. And they're very similar, but they differ in a few aspects. The first is the answer that they provide. So if a filter just gives you a yes, no answer. Does this thing match or doesn't it? Is the price 10 or isn't it? Is it the price between 10 and 100 or isn't it? Queries, on the other hand, look at relevance. How relevant is this document for this query string? All right, it's a much more subtle answer that it's going to give back to you. It's not one or zero. It, it's, uh, it, it can basically be any floating point number in the positive range. Filters you tend to use for exact values. Uh, so, you know, numbers, dates, and so on. But for strings, where, where status equals active would be a typical example of, of where you'd use a filter. While queries are really for full text looking for the quick brown fox in uh, the body of an email or something like that. Because of the simple nature of the result of a filter, it's easy to cache. So not only does it not have to ca calculate the relevance score, it can be re represented very, in a very small amount of uh, space. So filters can be cached, making them really fast. Queries, on the other hand, can't be cached. Uh, and the result is that filters are typically faster and queries are slower. So what you want to do is to filter out everything that you can at the beginning and then just run the queries on the documents that remain in your set. The next bit we look at is some syntax, because you need to plug these filters and queries into something. And we've got the search API here. And the API takes a query parameter. So into this spot, we can fill in any query. For instance, we can look for search in the title field. Um, if you don't, or, or this query, match all, just matches all documents equally. And in fact, if you don't specify a query, that's what you're getting by default. Filters, on the other hand, 
can't be passed directly to this query. They need to be, uh, you need to sort of switch into filter context. And there's a special query exactly for that called the filtered query. And it takes a query and filter parameter. So we can move our uh, search in the title field clause into the query field. And we can say we're going to filter on documents where the status field is active. If you just want the filter, well, you could use a match all query there. And in fact, you could just leave it out altogether. OK, so this gives you the sort of structure for where to plug these queries and clauses. Um, Obviously, this already takes up a fair bit of space on the screen, so I'm not going to repeat this all the time. Um, but what you're wanting to do is either fill in a query and filter here, or at the top level, a query here. You'll, you'll see this in action. The next thing to think about is how your data is indexed. So let's say we've got these two documents. Quick brown rabbits. Brown rabbits are commonly seen. Keeping pets healthy my quick brown fox eats rabbits on a regular basis. Now, I'm sure we've all done this, where we put this into a, an SQL database and run a query like this. Just give me everything, you know, wildcard brown, wildcard fox. That's slow and inflexible. It's really not going to give you decent results. And instead, what we want to do is to take these string values and pass them through some analysis process. And like I said, analysis can be quite complex. Uh, but the basis is fairly simple. Essentially, we want to take all of these words, divide them up into separate words, and then normalize those words. Uh, normalization can mean lots of things, but typically lower casing is a good example of that. So this just becomes a list of quick brown rabbits. Brown rabbits are commonly seen. And the, ca uh, the capital letters have been lower cased. Then we build a sorted list of unique terms that occur across, across all of our documents, and we mark where they occur. All right, so now, if we want to do the query for brown fox, all we have to do is look up brown in the, terms, in the sorted terms list, fox in the sorted terms list, and we've got a result. So the uh, document one and document two, uh, document one matches both terms, uh, Sorry, I can't read. Document one matches one term, document two matches both terms. And we've got an answer. And this structure is called an inverted index. And it, it's not just for text. It, it can equally be used for dates, numbers, booleans, uh, geolocations, geoshapes. Pretty much any data, uh, type of data can be represented in an inverted index. So that's how it's stored. Um, we're going to start now looking at the types of questions that you want to ask of your data. And we'll start with the simple stuff, the structured queries that you'll be used to from SQL. Things like where field equals value. Now, looking at here, you can see that the, the content field in document one has actually got lots of values. So where field is, is value actually is where field contains value, all right? Uh, and for that, we use something called a term filter. This is what it looks like. Uh, it specifies the type of filter, the field, and the exact value that we're looking for. Just to plug it in into the context, we've got our search request, the query parameter. We need to use the filtered query. Uh, we have to fit in a filter and a query. We just want a filter, so this is a match all. And we plug our filter in here. All right, so I I'm not going to repeat the rest of this on later examples, uh, but you can see how to plug it in. How does this actually work? Well, we go to the inverted index for the title field, and we look up the value in this sorted list. We find brown. Uh, that gives us document one with a yes result, document two with a no, and we've got our answer. So the, this term filter ends up with a, a result that is represented as a bit set, one bit for every document. And that bit set looks like that. Document one has, uh, is true, document two is false. The nice thing about this is it's really small. You can represent lots and lots of documents in a very small amount of space. So we can cache it. And here we cache it as title brown. And we're done. The next time we run this filter, it is going to reuse the cached value. And these are smart caches. You don't have to think about expiring them. You don't, as soon as you index something new, 
the, the caches are updated. Uh, Okay, so then a, a, another common SQL form where field in value, and for that, it's the terms filter, which looks a lot like the term filter. Ba basically, it takes an array instead of a single value. And here we find pets and quick. We've got one matching, uh, one match in each document, gives us a bit set of one comma one, and again, we can cache it. So these are very simple tools, but they form the building blocks of the more complicated things we come to later on. Similarly, we've got ranges, which uses the range filter. You specify a range, content, and then the comparators. So greater than, greater than, equal to, less than, less than, equal to. You, they can be unbounded, so you can just leave out the, the less than or whatever it is you want to do. And here we're looking for everything from A to M. So the way this works is it goes to the terms list and it basically scans through the list looking for everything that fits into that range and counts up the matching docs over here. Uh, again, gives us a bit set which we can cache. And this funny syntax here is a sort of Lucene syntax where a square bracket means inclusive and a curly bracket means uh, exclusive. Doesn't matter. Um, we can run ranges on date fields as well. The, when you index a numerical date field, it adds a bunch of extra terms to make ranges much more efficient than they are in the sort of standard string case. Because this is usually where ranges are, are used, on numbers and dates, not on strings. Um, you can even use date maths, so we could say everything uh, from now minus one hour. But now has a millisecond resolution. Okay, so it's very unlikely we are ever going to reuse this clause again. So using now like that means this filter is not going to be cached. However, we can round it off to the nearest hour, in which case there's a good chance we will use it again, and then it is cached. Uh, some other structures where field is not now really means where field has any term, uh, and that's the exists filter. Looks like that. And the opposite, where field has no term, uses the missing filter. Those are kind of the individual parts. Now we want to combine them with Boolean logic, all right? And for that, we use the bool filter, which looks like this. You've got must, should, and must not. Each of these take a, a number of filters. And the must basically maps to and, should to or, and must not to not. So here we could say that our document uh, must have rabbits in the title field, should have either quick in the content or quick in the title field, and must not have fox in the content field. Now, what if we wanted to say it must have quick and rabbits in the title field or the content field? Well, the nice thing is that we can nest these bulls. So when I said that must, should, and must not can take any filters, it can also take other bull filters. So this is how you end up building a fairly complex uh, sort of logic tree. So we reorganize it. To, and in the must clause, we have two bulls. And here we've got should have rabbits in the title or content field and should have quick in the title or content field. OK, so from here, you can see how you can express exactly the logic that you need. What's important to note about the uh, bool filter is that this part is not cached. These internal clauses are cached. And of course, each of these internal clauses just produces a bit set as a result. So what the bool filter will do is combine the results of all of these using bit set logic. And that's pretty much what it looks like. The bit set from that clause, or the bit set from that, and that, and not that. So uh, you, don't have, it, you don't end up caching this whole complicated structure, but each of these parts, which are the more expensive parts, because they actually have to go to disk and look things up, are cached and can be reused wherever they appear in the query. So title rabbits, just because it happens to be uh, sort of deep in this, uh, in this structure here, it doesn't mean that it's limited to being used in that structure. If it appears somewhere completely different, it will still be reused. 
So to recap, Boolean uh, results, yes or no, it either matches or it doesn't, used for exact values, it's cacheable, faster than queries usually, and you want to filter first and then query. So now we move on to queries, which are the more interesting thing. And, and if somebody's coming from a, room, um, a relational database background, it's, it's the kind of magical part of how something like Elasticsearch works. The question is, how relevant is this term that we're looking for? Uh, and the building block for, to answer this question is the term query, which is pretty much like the term filter plus relevance. Now, you actually probably won't use the term query very often yourself. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a sort of low-level query. You, we'll come to the match query later on, which is the query that you will use a lot. But understanding how this works will help you to understand how the match query works. So it looks just like the term filter. Term, title, brown. Uh, and here we plug it in. Of course, it's a query, not a filter. So we plug it in at the query level. Um, and when we get our results back, we have this score as part of it. The score represents how relevant this document is. And um, it, the absolute value is not important. What is important is uh, the relative value between two documents. So your results are being sorted by relevance, so they're being sorted by score. The documents near the top have got a higher score. The documents near the bottom have got a lower score. So we need to understand where this relevance score comes from. And really, there are three factors that are important. How common is the word we're looking for in this document? The more common it is, the more often that word appears within the document, the more important it's going to be. But then you also have to look at how common the word is in the whole index. So words like the, and, um, must are very common, and so they have little importance. If you had uh, obsequiousness, that's going to appear very seldom, and is, so is going to be a really important term to look for. And, and then finally, we've got uh, uh, the, the question of how long the document is. We're actually talking about fields rather than documents, okay? But, uh, so how long is this field? If you've got a title field, that's a short thing. And if a word appears in that short title field, it's likely to be more important than if the same word appears in the long body of an email. Uh, and the official word or terms for these uh, factors, uh, as known in the Lucene similarity algorithm, is term frequency, inverse document frequency, and the field length norm. Uh, and, and you'll hear these mentioned a lot in Elasticsearch and Lucene. And, and, and that's basically it. The term uh, query looks up the term, uh, finds the matching documents, and then calculates the relevance score using the algorithm that we've explained. So now, let's look at how you combine these to add some logic to it. Uh, we've got the bool query, which looks a lot like the bool filter, but is different. Must and must not are pretty much the same, but should is not quite the same. And you've got this extra parameter called minimum should match, which is, can be a bit tricky to understand, and it's probably easier by example. If you have no must queries, so we're saying it should match either quick or brown or rabbits. In this case, at least one of these values has to match for a document to be considered a match. In other words, the minimum should match parameter defaults to one in this case. However, if you have a must clause, then these should clauses are optional. None of them have to match. And so minimum should match is zero. So if none of these clauses have to match, what's the point of having them? Well, the answer lies in the, res the results you get from these things. The bool filter just says yes or no. So it makes sense for the should clauses to always count. But the bool query gives you a score. And as we said, that score is much more subtle. So it's not just a question of whether it matched, it's a question of how well it matched. The score from a bool query is calculated by taking the score of every matching query times the number of matching queries divided by the number of, of queries. So, these should clauses count 
all right? They, uh, the, the more matching should clauses you have, the higher the relevance of that document. So while they're not required to match, they are very useful to push the more relevant documents up to the top of the list. They give you a better relevance score. The minimum should match parameter can also be used to trim the long tail of low quality results. So this will match uh, quick or brown or rabbits in the title field. But it's going to match brown ha handbags, um, uh, quick wins, which documents which are really pretty irrelevant to the user's search if they have looked for quick brown rabbits. Uh, so we could say we want all of the values to match, or we could say we want 75% of the words that the, the user searched on to match. Of course, 75% of three terms uh, doesn't really work out, but the bulk query is smart enough to round things down. So really, this means two out of these three values must match for a document to be considered a match. And so you, you trim out the, all of those documents that only match one term here. Now we move on to the query that you are going to use a lot, and that is the match query. And the match query is a high-level query that understands the field mapping and the analysis chain. Okay, we'll, we'll explain how this works. Uh, so the match query first is going to take the query string the user passes in, pass it through an analyzer, like we did when we indexed the document, and then it's going to rewrite the query into the sort of low-level queries that are actually going to execute it. So if we start with the one-word query, uh, match title quick, if we'd used a term clause here, this wouldn't have found anything, because the exact value quick in capitals with an exclamation mark doesn't exist in the inverted index. But if we analyze that value, we end up with a single term quick, and that does exist in the index. So now, this match query gets rewritten as a single term query, and you know how that works already. Looks it up, calculates the relevant score. Multi-word queries do a similar sort of thing. So we start off with quick fox, analyze that, and it gives us two term queries. Quick in the title field, fox in the title field. Um, then we need to combine these scores, so it just wraps them in a Boolean. Uh, and it'll add these two scores together, and the documents that have got both of them will appear higher up the list, documents with one lower down the list. So it, it's very simple how it gets rewritten. Um, perhaps you want to say that all of the words must match. Uh, here, our title quick fox needs to change a bit, uh, is to take an extra parameter, and we add operator and. And all that does is change the should in this bull query into a must. That's the only effect it has. Similarly, if we want to trim the long tail, we can specify a minimum should match, and we, it's still a should, but now the minimum should match parameter is filled in there. So it, with that, you can understand why you get the results you do. The match query is no longer just this magic box. It does a bunch of other stuff as well. For instance, it'll handle fuzzy queries for you. Uh, the fuzzy queries use the Levenstein edit distance. Uh, what that means is how many changes do you need to make to one word to convert it into another? So for instance, here we can insert a letter to make bron brown. Uh, we can change, uh, uh, delete a letter, fox to fox. Uh, we can substitute one letter for another, and we can transpose two letters, switch, them, uh, switch their order. Each one of these steps is an edit distance of one, and in this case, we've got a, an edit distance of two. An edit distance of two happens to be the maximum that Lucene allows. But you can see how many changes you can make to a word with just an edit distance of two. It can match something that is uh, quite far from the original. If we were to specify an edit distance of two for something like bron, a short word like that, we could change it into some completely different word with absolutely no relation to the original. So rather than having to specify one or two, we can use the auto parameter in a query and it'll calculate the appropriate edit distance based upon the length of the, of the word, to up to a maximum of two. So quick bron fox will match the data in our, uh, in our index. We can also use phrase or proximity queries, where we're saying, 
I, I not only want to match all of these words, I want to match them in this order. All right, so no words in between, anything like that. Uh, so here we can use the match phrase query, or it also works as the match query type phrase. Quick brown fox in that order exists in our index, and so it's going to match. If we want to be less concerned about order, or perhaps allow a, f a few words to appear in between, you can specify a, a slot parameter, which gives, it's a bit like an edit distance for position. It, it allows things to be a little more flexible. And, of course, you can take these, the standard match query, fuzzy, and phrase query, and combine them together. Uh, so we're going to require that at least 75% of the words the user actually typed in are in our index uh, by using a, a minimum should match clause here. And that just looks like what we had before. It's a query with the words we're after, and minimum should match 75%. Then we want to expand the range a bit and perhaps match on, on words that are misspelt. So in one of the should clauses, we'll use fuzzy matching and with fuzzy auto. And then if the, they have, um, oh, 10 minutes, that's fast. <laughs> If, if they have the exact phrase that the user typed in, then we want to boost those up to the top. So we can add a proximity clause in here, and anything that matches that, uh, this query is going to be bumped up to the top. And that's a, a reasonable way of combining queries. Now we come to the hard bit, and that's multi-field queries. Uh, and you often see things like this on on websites uh, called advanced search. And actually, this is really easy to do because you, the user's telling you what fields this data is in. So you can just use a, a simple bull query here. This is not so easy. You, the user expects you to figure out what fields this data is in. And we could start off by, say, using a Boolean here, quick brown fox, uh, on the title and content fields. Um, but actually, this quick brown fox in, uh, in the second document, which is the better match, uh, is being beaten because th both fields here match brown. All right? So two matches are better than one, and we're getting results in the wrong order. The bull query is not the only way to combine queries. We've also got the dismax query. Uh, and the logic is slightly different. It takes all of the documents which match any query and then uses the best uh, matching query to produce the score. Uh, so now if we change this to a dismax query, the quick brown fox is the best matching clause and so this document moves up to the top. Uh, there's another parameter that DISMAC takes called the tiebreaker. Um, we matched brown here, but currently we're discounting it completely because we're just looking for the best matching field. Uh, but by specifying a tiebreaker, we can still take these secondary matches into account. And all it does is takes the best matching query and adds on the tiebreaker times the scores from the lesser matching queries. We have a multi-match query, which is like the match query on multiple fields. And it, it helps to reduce the amount of writing you have to, to do. So here's our disk max query, and it can be rewritten as a multi-match query like this. We specify the query, the fields to run on, and if you like, the tiebreaker. And there are actually three main types of multi-match query. Uh, this type, the default, is called best fields. So match on the best fields out there and give me the score from that. Um, so the best fields uh, type is best when you're looking for a whole concept in a single field and you don't know what field that is in. So we're looking for quick, quick brown fox. Those words together in a single field make more sense than those same words scattered across several fields. Um, and like we said, it gets rewritten as a dismax query. But quite often we have a single title field, something like a title field, which we want to analyze in different ways for different purposes. And we can do this using subfields here. So perhaps we want to stem it, reduce all of the words to their root form, so that instead of matching just jumps, we can match jumps, jumped, jumping, jump. 
Um, and perhaps we want to run it through edge n-grams to use it for autocomplete as well. So search as the type, we can match on that. Just to uh, give you an example of what these analyzers produce, the title field using the standard analyzer pretty much just breaks things up by words, removes punctuation. Title.stimmed changes jumped there to jump, and the autocomplete with edge engrams basically gives you all the parts of the words anchored to the beginning. So you can, you can see how if somebody types uh, brown fox j, you can match on brown, match on fox, and match on j, and it's a, a, a likely to be a good result. To actually use that uh, query, we specify the fields in the uh, in multi match query, but in here we use type most fields. So we've got the same text in every field, just analyzed in different ways. So the more matching fields, uh, the more fields that match, the better. Oh, the, the slide agrees with me. <laughs> And, and so instead of using a dismax here, it gets wrapped up in the bool query that we saw initially. There's one last uh, case, which is when your data is scattered across several fields and more than one field needs to match in order for a match to be valid. Um, so here we've got first name Reginald, middle name Kenneth, last name Dwight. Um, the temptation here is to think, well, we want to match on all of these fields and count all of those matches, uh, so perhaps we should use the most fields match. But this is wrong, and I'll explain why. The problem is that uh, most fields, and best fields for that matter, are both field-centric. So the most fields query gets rewritten re into something like this. And... It, It'll match anything that's got first name Reginald, middle name Reginald, and last name Reginald as a good match. So it's completely ignored two of our terms. Um, next problem is that we can't apply something like operator and or minimum should match. If we apply the and operator, it applies just to that field. So it would only uh, 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 find documents that had Reginald, Kenneth, and Dwight in the first name field, or the middle, or the last name field. That's not going to happen, doesn't work. Next problem is term frequencies. First name as Dwight is common, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Last name Dwight is uncommon. And what do we know about uncommon words? They have more weight. So an uncommon last name may uh, have more value than the, the, the common first name that the user is actually searching for. We have two solutions available to us. The first is an index time solution, and that's basically to index everything into a single full name field. Uh, we can still keep them separate, but we can index them into the full name field as well. So we've got the first, middle, and last names here. Uh, we're going to add a full name field and copy these values when we index from first, middle, and last into the full name field as well. This becomes simple. It's just a single uh, field query. So we, we've got all of the power of the minimum should match, uh, uh, sorry, of the match query at our disposal. Of course, we don't always think about these things before we index. So we have a query time solution as well. Uh, and it's a term-centric query. So instead of uh, looking at fields first, we change it around and we consider each term individually. So we want to find Reginald in the first, middle, or last fields, Kenneth in the first, middle, or last, and Dwight in the first, middle, and last. That solves the problem of minimum should match and making sure that you hit as many of different terms as possible, but it still doesn't solve the term frequencies problem because uh, first name Dwight is going to score a lot less than last name Dwight. And Two versions ago in Elasticsearch, uh, we released a new type of multi-match query, and it uses blending. So what it does is look up, it looks up Reginald in the first, middle, and last uh, fields and calculates a blended frequency score for those fields. Uh, and, and this makes our matching much more accurate. And this type is called cross fields. So, it's used to query multiple fields as if they were one single field. Uh, and 
everything looks the same as it did before, except we specify cross fields here. We can use minimum should match quite happily. Um, it, and the, the only thing that you have to be aware of here is that the first, middle, and last names must use the same analyzer. You can't come, have different analysis processes in these fields. They have to produce a single analyzer for this to work well. So to recap, uh, best fields when you have a whole concept in one field. Most fields, same text in several fields with different analysis chains and cross fields when you're trying to treat multiple fields as a single pooled field. If you can understand these building blocks, even though there are many more queries out there, the rest is just details. Uh, this gives you a, a solid foundation for understanding how to use the, the other things out there. Thank you very much, and thank you to Elasticsearch. We have time for questions. One minute, make it fast. <laughs> um, does Elasticsearch have some kind of built-in capability to um, provide it with multiple queries and then do a, a fallback if the first one doesn't match, then use the second one, et cetera, et cetera? No, it doesn't, it doesn't have that kind of fallback. Um, but what, what, if you combine several queries, uh, say, in a Boolean should, in should clauses, then the ones that match best are going to be pushed to the top. If nothing matches the best clause, then you're still going to have these low, more lo, sort of low-quality clauses available, and so those documents will rise to the top because there's nothing above them. Yeah, exactly. So the, the idea being, for example, in uh, in product search, uh, in product search, um, uh, very often you want to, uh, if you have a number of high-precision matches, you want to show those and nothing else. Um, so, so that... You could, you'd have to run multiple queries, yeah. uh, which you could do do at the same time using uh, M search. Thanks. If you were... The question is, what other types of analyzers do you have? Uh, the answer is a lot. <laughs> uh, yes, German's there. Uh, there are about 20-something languages supported out of the box. Uh, there are other plugins that support other languages. Uh, the, uh, you know, Unicode supporting things, there's uh, n-grams, edge n-grams, uh, uh, patterns, regexes, lots of things. Uh, do we support German compound words? There is the compound words token filter. Uh, it's how well it works depends on how good your dictionary is. Um, it's it's also quite heavy. Uh, so, I, I, frankly, I think it's a filter that needs rewriting. It, it needs rewriting in, in Lucene. Um, but, yes, it exists, and, uh, or an alternative approach would be to use an n-gram approach. I'm very sorry, we are running out of time. <laughs> I'll uh, be around, you can... Thanks, Clinton, for your talk. Thank you very much. And maybe you find him outside to ask him more questions. <laughs>